them right. rather than help them do it for themselves, if that right. makes right. sense. Yeah. Sounds like more empowerment. And yeah. I think that's hard for parents when they're used to doing four when kids yeah. are little and there's that transition piece <laughs> that you're trying to tackle. Exactly. Great. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. And with that comes some stigma. I think when we're talking about youth, um, getting the courage to talk about mental health and then you as allies helping. Can you tell us a little bit about that, Nikki? Well, I think there's a few elements to that because young, young people, I think, are actually really great at being able to talk about uh, their, you know, what they're going through, their struggles, and they need that safe space to be able to talk. But I think the adults sometimes struggle because there's all these extra things that get kind of added in. There's shame. There's, there's what will people think? Did I screw up as a parent? Did, you know, there's some of these extra layers that actually create the stigma that then really impairs our young people from being able to get the supports they need because now that adult is struggling to be a safe person for that young person to talk to. Mm -hmm. And so being able to really reduce stigma and saying, hey, mental health is a real thing. We need to talk about it. We need to talk about it openly and without shame. Recognizing that every single one of us uh, struggles with things, anxious moments or depressed moments or those ups and downs of life. They're very normal. And if we can, um, as adults, uh, get really comfortable about talking about mental health, that now creates safety all the way through our families, through our schools, and through all those places. So reducing stigma, recognizing there's tons of supports and resources and safe places in the community to go to right. if, if home isn't that safe place, um, there's lots of options and we need to be talking about it. Right, definitely. And what are some of those options, Nikki? I know specifically you're working with Woodview. Um, how can people get that support? I just love that. Woodview is huge and Woodview is um, our key provider for children and youth under 18 and their families. And so if you need supports for your children or your young person, Woodview has those services. And all you have to do is call Woodview. It's super easy. and. As an adult, we also struggle with those. So St. Leonard's is, is here in town. They have a 24-7 you know, crisis line that you can access no matter how old you are, what you're going through. Uh, th those supports are available and the list goes on from there. Right. right. And what would you recommend to maybe an adult that's watching that is maybe going through exactly what you just stated? Um, what can you recommend to them to, to do to kind of seek that help? I'd actually like to hear from Zach on that. Zach, what advice would you give adults? <laughs> give adults on like yeah. uh, seeking help, um, like in terms of like finding resources and such. Well, yes, maybe for their for their children or for a young person in their life. Definitely, just like putting in the research and finding maybe what resources would best suit what like the child or youth is going through. So if you find that maybe your child is going through something that kind of pure more of like an anxiety or um, like panic. Mm -hmm. Then maybe trying to do some research on local uh, resources that deal or specialize in anxiety or panic disorder treatment might benefit them. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I think it's also really important to listen to our young people and to our kids and to believe them when they say they're struggling. Right. Um, nobody's looking to create drama. So if they're, if they're struggling, believe them and get them the support that they need. Right. And together, yeah. you can do things. Right, uh -huh. giving them a voice and not making assumptions and mm -hmm. right. telling mm -hmm. them it'll be okay. Right, don't tell them what to do, invite them right. to the process, listen to them, let them be part of the solution. Right. Uh, kind of like what Zach said earlier, like let them be involved in the process. Right. Yeah, because 90% of the time they do know what they need and it rather than sort of prejudging like, oh, well this helped when you were a kid when the parent was the one mm -hmm. sort of in control, that most of the time the kid knows what they need to help themselves. Right. It's just a matter of doing that active listening portion and, and trying to understand from their perspective. Right. So uh, understanding is a big piece, and I want to kind of get an idea of what you're seeing at Woodview, Zach. What kind of things, because that kind of sure informs your programming, informs the kind of support. So what kind of things are you seeing? A lot of, uh, I've been seeing, especially with the work that Nikki's been doing, um, a more involvement when it comes to parents being directly involved with trying to help their children seek treatment. Um, especially with like uh, Engagement Brant, which is uh, one of the programs Nikki helps run, where parents are directly involved with 
trying to set up programs that will benefit them uh, in educating themselves on how to properly support their child, as well as um, having youth also on board, so that way we uh, there's a bigger, I guess, uh, gap of understanding gauge-wise. We have parents who are having kids go through it, and we're also having youth on the board who have gone through it or will possibly. Right. Awesome. Now we only have a short uh, moment left with you both, um, but Nikki, can you share a little bit about like what self-care actually is? Well, self-care could be a lot of things, uh, but Zach actually said the best thing the other day when we were on the phone, and he said, self-care is what you need in the moment. And it could be sleep, it could be that cup of coffee or that donut, but it probably is checking whether or not you need that social media feed right now. It's probably asking the hard questions about, you know, uh, what you're putting in, how you're caring for yourself, have you eaten today? You know, those types of things. And self-care is getting honest and getting real about what you need and how you access those really important resources for yourself. And right. if we can actually believe that we're worth that kind of care, um, it will transform our mental health. Right. Awesome. And Zach, where can people find, if they want to reach out to Woodview, where can uh, people reach out to Woodview? <laughs> oh, <laughs> um, probably the best way to do it is just go up on our, uh, the Woodview website and, um, and that all of the contacts as well as all the locations. Uh, in Harmony Square, we have a drop-in center for youth uh, every Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday at well, what time again? From 5 to 7. Yeah, 5 to 7, where youth can just pop in and kind of see the facilities and meet other youth. Wonderful. Thank you so much for joining us today and sharing what your organization does. We'll be right back after this. This program is brought to you by Ignite TV. Now you're in command. Visit rogers.com for more details. Hey folks, it's me, Giovanni Petiti, the host of the RTV Quiz Show, the hottest show on television. It's the hilarious quiz show where you, the viewers, play for valuable non-existent prizes. It's got great trivia, fun facts, and a lot of laughs, all blended together in a perfect cocktail of edutainment. So join us Wednesdays at 7.30, right here on Rogers TV. Nice. Our world is changing. Now more than ever, we have seen firsthand the brutality of systematic racism. Here in Canada, we can do better. It is time to connect, commit, and change. I'm Queen. And I'm Aaliyah Ali, and we're inviting you to join us on Diverse and Converse. We'll connect you with leaders from the Black, Indigenous, and people of color communities. Now is the time for change. I am God Greg. My name means everything. Tom Longboats. I am Wolf Clan, Onondaga Nation. I've run many different races. I've run to survive and to be free. I've run to win for honor. These people might be lazy, but this one's damn fast. My people respected our runners, people who carried important messages from village to village. I need a guide to the next post. Dispatch carrier, sir. I can get you there. God sakes, man, slow down. Who do you think I am, Tom Longboat? No, sir. I am. Running makes me feel alive. It's everything. Tom Longboat was the first indigenous person to win the Boston Marathon. He ran his way to international fame and became an inspiration to generations of athletes. Learn how to create your own masterpiece while in the comfort of your own home. On the Canvas with Lisa Braun is a step-by-step -step art lesson. On the Canvas, Mondays at 5.30 p.m. on Rogers TV. When an impaired driver killed my brother DJ, my life changed forever. During the pandemic, all of our lives changed and many of us turned to alcohol and drugs to cope. As life returns to normal, the increase in substance use from COVID has lingered and some police services report an increase in impaired driving that caused heartbreak and devastation. Now, more than ever, we need your commitment to never drive impaired. 
and to encourage all of your family and friends to do the same. Together, we can save lives. Welcome back to Kickback. We are now joined by Jordan from Brant Mental Health Solutions. Mm -hmm. Jordan, thank you so much for being here and sharing. Uh, we've had you on Kickback before um, in the other years that we've done this, so welcome back. Thank, thank you, you. For, thank you for being here. Yeah, it's good to be back in person. So, uh, so we wanted to start off with you sharing uh, your personal story um, and uh, the kind of how that built and got you into the career that you're in now. Um, so can you share a little bit about what you do? Cool. So I'm a lots of different titles you can call it clinician, <laughs> counselor, psychotherapist, social worker. <laughs> right. I help people at Brant Mental Health Solutions mm -hmm. in in Brantford. Um, and I, I I'll start with this. Uh, I think most people that I work with, at least, have their own story of why they do what they do. Mm -hmm. um, mine definitely started pretty young. Uh, we learn in this field a lot of it is your environment and some is genetics so you when you get the the two mixed together then you have experiences in life so uh my backgrounds personal experiences definitely things like anxiety uh so at, at work we call it school anxiety right so that was the first kind of big thing for me uh not the greatest they used to have french in grade one Right, and I remember kids that. don't know that anymore. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right? Chien, chat. That's about all I know. <laughs> exactly. Yep. Yeah. 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 <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Um, and not the not the greatest experience with that. Mm -hmm. So then, probably now today you would say a bit of trauma with that, mm -hmm. right? Um, and then rocky road through that, right? It depended kind of on the teacher and that right. sort of thing, and then it would carry over to home and all that kind of stuff and pretty good with things like friendships but it, you know it's a lot of uh, a lot of putting on that face that you're okay when you're not right? right so very draining you go through things like they think other things are going on that are like physical health things but they're not right right so I don't think I ever had asthma but oh it's asthma right but no I'm having right. panic attacks yeah. right yeah right. things like that so um, when I hit high school again pretty good like sports are great friends are great mm -hmm. but just those certain people in higher authority positions that just not great interactions and it brings you back mm -hmm. so you know I'd be building up and then you know knock down right. a peg again and stuff like that so always a bit of a struggle uh, grade 12 um, I was in a biology class and maybe grade 11 and I was figuring out I'm not good at science or math um, right. at all yeah um, and great teacher though and to pass the class she's like do your project on something that you like know that you're interested in mm -hmm. and like oh it'll be good I said, okay so at that time I had you know I got some help and I was like oh I'm gonna do it on like how brain chemicals work mm -hmm. right and that's kind of what got me <laughs> going right so yeah. I was getting help and then I did that project and I was like oh this is pretty cool stuff like I can understand science in this way right right so I just ran with that and I was just like you know what forget kind of doing athletic training or whatever I was thinking of doing right like I can I wanted to help people but I'm gonna help people like this mm -hmm. right so uh, got my I had to retake a lot of courses like a lot I was back in with like grade <laughs> 10s and stuff and like yeah so it took a lot of work um, every year I went I was more interested, so took psychology at Laurier, went on to grad school, took counseling psychology. Uh, regulations in Ontario changed a lot, so then I took extra courses to get registered with the social work college. Uh, long road, so worked for um, Woodview, who I know has been on, mm -hmm. is going to be on kickback. Um, started there and then slowly built, worked in the, with, uh, in the disab disability field for a while, mm -hmm. and then goal was to work for a practice in Brantford and now I'm at Brand Mental Health Solutions and work with lots of people and we talk about it all the time how you carry over your what you've learned right so you learn we always say like you learn 50% in school and 50% is on the job and what you've experienced in your life right. so it's a big help especially to, to younger people um, what we call self-disclosing so telling your interjecting your story mm -hmm. into the practice right right so yeah it's 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 a really interesting 
journey and job now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and it's funny to say like, would you change anything? It's hard. It's like, of course, I don't want to have to have gone through hard things, but I always say I don't want people to have to go through what I did. Mm -hmm. So that's what drives me. Because people say, don't you get drained? Don't you take this home? Don't you? I said, right. no. I always just think of. That's my every day. I just wake up. No, this is what my job is today. This is what my goal is today. This is who I'm seeing, and my job is to make sure they they don't experience what I did. And I just think of it like that. I just keep going. I don't. It sounds like the empathy you have because of your personal experience makes you the therapist that you are. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So if I get low, like we all do, I think back to, you know what? It's just have some self-compassion for myself. And this is what I meant to do. And I kind of, we call it compartmentalizing. So, you know, this can wait my own thing. I'll be fine. And today I see five people or six people, and I'm going to use every tool that I have to help them one by one. And I get, I say, um, I'm sure the word will come up on kickback. Mindfulness is a huge part of the job. Right. And it helps me doing the job in turn helps me. And that's what I think is the greatest part is like we all help each other. It's a calling for you, it's obvious. Yeah. It's, yeah. yeah. Exactly. Amazing. Yeah. Awesome. Well, we will be right back after these messages with more from Jordan. Weekly in-depth coverage of the most local stories in Stratford, Perth, Brantford Branch, Guelph, Wellington, and the Waterloo region. Hyperlocal stories that matter to you and your community. All this and more on your region this week. All local, all year round. New episodes every Friday at 7 p.m. right here on Rogers TV. On the Art Trail with Joanne returns for season two. We have a terrific lineup coming up for you. We will be interviewing folks like gallery owners, musicians, a theater impresario, a master Japanese calligrapher, and much more. So watch on the Art Trail with Joanne, Saturdays at seven. In studio and on the road invites you to find out what's happening in your own backyard. From tasty treats to interesting people and places, join host Vic Fulliet for In Studio and On the Road, Thursdays at 7.30 p.m. Learn how to create your own masterpiece while in the comfort of your own home. On the Canvas with Lisa Braun is a step-by-step -step art lesson. On the Canvas, coming this fall to Rogers TV. be a slave. That word, I hate it. It rests on my tongue like rot. Peter, how does it feel to get paid for your work? There are rumors freedom's coming for us all. Freedom, you know that's all I want. Chloe, careful. Vroom men would rather sell you across the river to America than let you go free. Then I'll run. I've run before. Maybe this time for good. Chloe Cooley's resistance led to Canada's first legislation limiting slavery. After 200 years, slavery was abolished in Canada in 1834. I did it. I need it. A hero gave it. And I am alive. As an organ donor, you can save up to eight lives and enhance the lives of 75 others. Please go to our website, pledge a gift of life. You'll be glad you did.
welcome back. Again, we have Jordan joining us from Brant Mental Health Solutions. Uh, Jordan, thank you so much for sharing your story. Um, we wanted to talk a little bit more about, uh, you had mentioned like you putting that mask on, and I think everybody does that to a different degree, uh, but can you share a little bit about what you would recommend to somebody um, that maybe is dealing with that and how they can help um, take it off? Sure, sure. So that's, that's a natural thing first, right? Mm -hmm. Just like um, when we talk to clients about thoughts, we all have not so great thoughts sometimes. It's the level to which you have those thoughts mm -hmm. and the intensity. So the same goes for putting on that mask, right? Um, I always give the example, if anybody's seen the movie The Mask with Jim Carrey, mm -hmm. his therapist doesn't believe that it's a real mask, right? So he does the, everyone wears a mask, he says, yeah. right? So I always think about that. But I'm like, yeah, they consulted in that movie because he's right, that right. is a real thing. Right, um, so the, the the healthy level of that is in terms of your roles in life. So I wear a mask when I go to work. Mm -hmm. I am myself, but I just mean that professionally. Right, right. To, from this time to this time, I am a therapist. Right, and then I have my personal life. Mm -hmm. So I have that mask at home, probably the least amount. Right, right. Um, but then you have a mask you wear with your friends. Mm -hmm. You have a mask you wear in the community, maybe. Right? And those are just little subtle changes. You still want to be yourself. Mm -hmm. It's just maybe I'm, for example, small things like in this group, it's probably not good to swear. Or in this group, it's probably uh, I should act a little more professionally. Right? right? That's, that's the level of healthy, right? Mm -hmm. right? But when we find that where I think the word like acting speaks to people more, when you find you have to act, it's like an effort, right? So everybody's heard be yourself. Well, that's easier said than done. So it's not be yourself, it's watch for when you're acting. That's why I always tell people where you're actually putting this effort in, right? That's where it creeps in, I find, with the high stress and like a bit of social anxiety because clients will tell me, I don't know what to do with my hands, I don't know what to do, should I be this far away, should I be, so this analytical thinking. So it's thinking of the consequences of the mask to kind of be like, oh, it's kind of counterintuitive. The more I put this on, the more I'm being unnatural. They think they're making themselves look more natural, right? So I always say, ask a friend you trust, say, does it look like I'm putting that mask on a little too much, right? When, like later in private, and, and they'll tell you, right? That's a classic thing in, in counseling is like, what would a friend tell me, right? So we can kind of take ourselves out of our own mind. Well, I trust them and they're seeing what reality is I'm not. Right. Such an important message for young people, Jordan, because I think they're learning who they are, first yeah. of all, different than adults who've kind of maybe figured it out. Yeah. But then also the images and the messages that young people are getting in media. Can you talk a little bit about that? Because that must create a lot of insecurity for young people. Yeah. Um, I think one media moves so fast. Like, yes the apps that are around right like have been around for a few years or a lot of years now but how they're used um, and how they're interacted with that's what changes so fast um, and I think a lot of it is we don't want to say like unconscious but it's it's not sometimes what parents think or it's like oh this exact subject matter I don't want you watching that it's more like what it's literally doing to brain development that's where the science is kind of going right now. It's not so much like, oh my gosh, I don't want you hearing that kind of language or something like that. It's more, wow, it's the amount of time you're watching these types of videos and late at night and taking away from you interacting with your friends in person. And I always say you have to have a healthy balance of where the world is going and also being human and how what we're supposed to do genetically. Right, Just, to develop that sense of self yes. with human interaction. That's right. It's, I, I don't always like to go like, it's not a cliche, it's just reality is the balance. Right? Everybody likes that word, you have to have balance, but for real, like in brain development, you have to have balance because we can't deny technology, you can't fight against that, right? But you also can't fall into being, I say, being a robot. You're not a robot, you're a human being. Right. Right. So you have to have that balance of social connection because that's there's I mean they can't say 1,000 hundred percent right now that this equals this with brain development but they're very confident that for example COVID and the amount of time spent at home 
um, on devices has really, like, brain scans are showing these areas are smaller. The brain aged faster for, for kids and teens. Right. So I think we need to be a bit more mindful of that. Um, so it's a mix of gently encouraging kids and teens to uh, pull away from the tech, but also not just saying, nope, for these days, you're done. Like, none. <laughs> you, have to be, you have to be realistic. Right. And uh, I would say engage with your kids. Don't just order them. Do this. I don't want you to do that. No, it's, listen, this is why. And these are your options, right? Like, I want you to go out or I want you to at least go on video right. something for this long. And you can play a game. You can go here. I'll take you there. That sort of thing instead of just black and white. Um, the options are definitely important right now. And right. being a little more um, understanding of it's, it's hard. That's the stigma in mental health. You can't see it. So, again, it's, well, you should be fine. Like, it's back. Kids are back in school, and you're in person. You should be good. Well, it's not the case right now. Lots of kids Lots and teens. Lots of shoulds, are right? We're, yes. Yeah. So I say again, balance. You have to remember, like, whether it is showing your, if your teen is showing your parents a brain scan off of Google that look at, this is what happened to my brain during COVID. It's going to take a little bit for it to readjust. Right. right. So I say that to teachers and. So, and I'm assuming in the work you're doing as a therapist, you're kind of starting that dialogue within families. Big time. Definitely in the last, since the start of this school year, a lot. I've been connecting with teachers, school boards, parents, probably the most um, I've ever had consent forms signed for me, the teen agreeing. And a lot of times they will agree now. Right. they see the benefit of me being able to connect with their parents too right. so and it's a mix i've never had it like this i'll have yeah. just them then their family comes in then them then a mix and but it that's what's needed yeah and right. uh, so if people wanted to reach out and get more information from you how can they do that um, you can find me on um, brandmentalhealth.com and our phone number is 509-302-2300 and we're located right near the Brantford General Hospital. Wonderful. Thank you so much for joining us today, Thanks, Jordan. And we'll be right back after this break. Hey folks, it's me, Giovanni Patini, the host of the RTV Quiz Show, the hottest show on television. It's the hilarious quiz show where you, the viewers, play for valuable non-existent prizes. It's got great trivia, fun facts, and a lot of laughs, all blended together in a perfect cocktail of edutainment. So join us Wednesdays at 7.30 right here on Rogers TV. Nice. October 5th, 2014, my daughter was hit by a train. She was walking along the sides of the tracks, and it shattered her world. <laughs> Personal finance show that dares to ask those money questions you've always wanted to. Join Mike Brega when he talks with experts on all aspects of money. Money Matters with Mike Brega Thursdays at 8 p.m. on Rogers TV. Heartbeat of Mother Earth, I feel you and embrace your warmth. I see you dancing through the trees. Your song floats on the summer breeze. Community, we come together. We are the voice of our ancestors. Thankful for how much you bless us. Feel the thunder in the drum. All our voices sing as one. Feel the power, feel the pride. Feel the drum beat deep inside. Feel the boom, feel the bass. Let's let go of time and space. It'll make you dance, it'll make you sing. Oday Wei Gun, Wadok Wishin. The drum will lead you, take you far. Always remember who you are. a little messy while having a whole lot of fun. Mindful Makers explores the world around you and inspires you to think outside the box. Join Agnes and her friends as they share crafty projects and talk to local artists. 
Mindful Makers, Mondays at 6 p.m. on Rogers TV. Yo. Yep. Okay, I'll be there. Welcome back to Kickback. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we really appreciate you taking the time out of your day to join us. I am excited to have Sean Forfaro, um, Rogers employee, OHL coverage, um, kind of voice of the Kitchener Rangers. Uh, thank you so much for joining us uh, today, Sean. Thanks, Ben. Um, I'm happy to be here, and uh, I, I love that Kickback is back once again. And I've always loved that you guys do this, and I'm thrilled to see it back this year. Yeah, thank you. And so today you've come, you're coming in, and you're sharing a, a very like, a personal story of something that you very recently um, dealt with, something that nobody ever expects to have to deal with. Can you can you share um, your experience, your story? Sure. Sure. Um, so it's relatively recent. It happened just near the end of uh, 2022. Um, for privacy reasons, I can't get into the full details of it, but in essence, it was a, a violent home invasion mm -hmm. by a, a family member, someone who's trusted to be in the house. And uh, this person had some substance abuse issues and some mental health issues. And uh, thankfully, we had a safety plan in place that re required my wife and I to lock ourselves in our bedroom while uh, this person was in a, a drug-fueled, substance-fueled rage, which went into a bit of a psychosis. And there was a lot of anger and rage and smashing of things in the house while we were locked in that room and had to call 911. Um, and then when they realized the door was locked, they attempted to break down the door to get to us. Mm -hmm. So we were physically holding the door back. Uh, the door was eventually broken through, but we were able to still keep it closed and then push push a dresser in place uh, until we were, you know, police got there and right. the situation resolved itself thanks to the 911 call. Right. And then that launched into what we've been dealing with for the past six weeks, a combination of things with police and courts and uh, paramedics and hospitals. Right. And it's just been uh, uh, a lot to deal with, as you can imagine. Right, definitely. And, and the reason I kind of reached out to you when I saw a kickback was I thought, maybe might be a little heavy as i said in my initial email to you but i wanted to share my experience not necessarily from the exact moment of it but what i've done to try and heal coming out of right. it right. so what um what that incident did for me in the moment that was a it was a wednesday morning and the next 24 hours were a blur uh once everything got settled and uh, we we couldn't physically couldn't be at home even though it was at the time safe to be at home we just couldn't it right. was a, our home became a place of trauma mm -hmm. for us so we were in a hotel for a few days and in that first 24 hours i had flashbacks to that moment behind the door that moment where i'm leaning against the door with my right shoulder and pushing with everything i have mm -hmm. and the moment the door mechanism breaks and flies off and I think that they're making their way into the room. Right. We were afraid, we were literally afraid for our lives and trying to find a way to get my wife out of a small bedroom window. So that led to once, once the adrenaline of the first day came down and we settled into the hotel room, I think 13 hours later, it was just a full breakdown, mm -hmm. like a full mental and emotional breakdown. And that didn't stop for a day. And every five or 10 minutes, I felt myself back in that spot and I'd feel myself tense up and I'd lean in and I just kept, as I've learned through therapy since, which I'll get to in a moment, yeah. I, I'm placing myself back in that exact moment, that 10 minute stretch of terror. So the next day um, when I couldn't function and I couldn't hold my stuff together, which is okay, it's okay yep. not to be okay, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, But I just couldn't. I couldn't cope 
and um, I hadn't been to therapy for a while, but I've been to therapy in the past, and it's been an overwhelmingly positive experience for me. And I sought out um, the therapist that I had gone to about five years for some uh, some issues, and uh, he specializes in PTSD and trauma. Mainly work with first responders. I'm not a first responder, obviously, right. but uh, I was able to get through and get in an emergency appointment with him that same day. Amazing. So I went in that day, um, and uh, I immediately, f I mean, it wasn't better, but I felt better coming out of the office than I did going into the office in terms of coping mechanisms and grounding techniques and ways to feel safe and learning about your what my, my irrational brain was telling me versus what my rational brain knows. My rational brain knows I'm safe at right. 8 o'clock on Thursday night, but my irrational brain tells me all the things I should be scared of because of what happened 36 hours earlier. Right. Being able to learn that quickly helped helped me a lot in those early days. And I've since gone to, uh, I think, three or four sessions now. I have another one tomorrow. And we're trying different things. We're doing different things, but I'm, I'm tackling this trauma head on mm -hmm. um, to try and get my life somewhat back to normal. So in the, in the days after, um, I had an incredible amount of work lined up. As you know, we know each other through mm -hmm. Rogers TV and uh, I do the Kitchen Arrangers broadcast. I do a lot of public address announcing for sports. I had four events, university events that I was doing, some hockey and some basketball. And naively, I thought I could do those. Right. And I realized only a couple hours before I couldn't. There's no way I can sit on a microphone and do these games. And uh, I had to cancel at the last minute. Thankfully, they were able to find replacements. But um, after a few days, I'm like, I need to, I need to try something. I can't, I can't become agoraphobic. I can't just lock myself in the right. house because this is safe. I have to do what I do, what I love. And I had a hockey game coming up, and I'm like, I'm gonna go to the hockey game. I'm mm -hmm. gonna, I'm gonna work the game. And thankfully, in my role for Rogers, like you've got your play-by-play -play and your color guys that are calling the action. I'm the host, so I talk at the beginning of the game. Mm -hmm. I do an intermission segment. I do small segments, and they're all under three minutes. So right. I'm like, I can tackle that. That wasn't mm -hmm. that imposing to me. And if I have to have my emotional moments, um, I can, I can. I can get it together for right. a couple of minutes. Right. And so I said, I got to try. Dove in both feet in the pool and went to the rink. And I was at the rink for five hours. And I didn't think about it once, mm -hmm. which was unfathomable to me. If you would have told me as I was driving in to the arena, you're going to be calm and level-headed and not think about the trauma that happened less than a week ago, for the next five hours, I would have said, there's no chance, there's no mm -hmm. chance. And I went in and I felt the confidence I normally feel when I'm there, the happiness, this, this work. I'm so fortunate to work in the places that I work and they make me happy, they give me joy. It doesn't feel like work. I work with incredible people, all of our volunteers, all the people at the rink. And to see all those people, that actually happened to be Rogers Night with the Rangers. So mm -hmm. we got to see some people from the office that were there. And seeing those familiar faces, it's comfort. It's, right. it's your extended family. And it was calming. And it was joyous. Mm -hmm. And sure, I'll be really honest, when I left, it all came flooding back. But not as fast. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, I'm seeing progress. Right. I'm seeing the baby steps. I'm seeing progress. So. The reason I think this is valuable to kick back is I could have easily said, no, I've got this, I'll just work through it on my own. Right, which would be something that, uh, like to stereotype, men would normally uh, yeah. like, do, right? Like, oh, I've, I can work through I've this got on my this. own, I've got this. Right? Yeah, and, to, and, and maybe in the early stages I did say that, maybe mm -hmm. I didn't think I got this, but my wife said to me, you need to contact your therapist. And I was reluctant at first, only because I thought I was too emotional. Mm -hmm. But but she pressured me gently and yeah, lovingly, yeah. only over the course of one half day. Yeah. Every time I broke down, like, I think you need help. And finally, she convinced me that I did. Right. And I really did. And so that's, there's no time frame, right? You, you, you hear stories about people, I'm sure, that are revisiting trauma from their life from 30 or 40 years ago. Mm -hmm. Right? There's no statute of limitations on how long before you can tackle it. But right. the longer you get away from it, 
I'm no, I'm no expert. I'm yeah. not giving empirical evidence, but I'm quite sure that the longer you get away from it, the harder it is to deal with. Right. So I'm like, I'm tackling this immediately. Mm -hmm. So 20 to 30, 30 hours later, I'm in my, I'm in the chair right. with my first appointment, and I've been tackling it as, as well as I can, and I'm, and it's helping. It's helping. It's baby steps. I'm still so far from where I need to be, and it's a struggle every day, but. What I'm working through in my therapy sessions is giving me progress in every step. Every day I feel like is a step forward. Right. And uh, how, why was it important for you to come here and sit in that chair and share your story today? Well, a as you say, you know, maybe it's stereotypical. Some people are out there and they may think they might be on the bubble between should I do something or should I not do something. And that's where I, I'm, I'm hoping this is the camera. If you're out there and you're that <laughs> one person, that thinks maybe you don't need the help, don't be ashamed. Go, please. If this reaches one person, Ben, mm -hmm. that's my goal. Right. I, I don't, I don't want to come on and tell a story about what happened in our family. It's yeah. tough. It's tough to talk about. What I'm learning through in my therapy sessions is that I have to talk about it. And I think this time, today, the day we're shooting this, this is the, the fifth time I've told the story without breaking down. Mm -hmm. And I'm close yeah. right now. Um, so, but I have to, like I have to go through it. Yeah. I have to revisit it. And, and I've learned in those sessions that um, there are ways to work through that. That adrenaline that I felt in there, that, that's what the crash was, right, right, at the end. And that's why I broke down. Mm -hmm. And fight or flight, and I'm learning all these different things. We actually, um, one of the things we've been working on is something called brain spotting. I'm not sure if you've ever heard of that. I haven't. Um, it's kind of like a cousin of, of EMDR, and I can't speak to the science behind it, but I was willing to give it a try when my therapist suggested it. And while EMDR uses eye movement to access trauma and healing, um, brain spotting uses eye location. So they've they tested my eyes in a session on different eye positionings and um, found what was called, I believe, the activation spot. And I might be getting these reversed, but yeah. I believe it's called the activation spot, which for all intents and purposes is the bad spot. Mm -hmm. So when I'm trying to work through that moment behind the door, they found my eye position that was important to that. Yeah. And then they found what was called the resource spot, which is the good spot. And that's where you get your confidence and you fuel up to attack it. So if yeah. we want to try and attack where that trauma is physically stored in my body through a lock of my eye position, then I go to my activation spot and I all those emotions come flooding, the mm -hmm. trauma comes flooding and as long as you can handle it, you handle it and then you change your eye position to your resource spot and you refuel until you can handle it and you do it as long as you want back and forth. It was yeah. incredibly helpful uh, and I'm looking forward to trying it again but it was new. I had never heard of it yeah. and uh, uh, it was suggested to me in a session. I did some reading. I watched some videos on it. I said I wanted to give it a shot, and it was remarkably helpful. Awesome. Thank you so much for sharing, Sean. We really appreciate you taking the time to come here and share this story, um, just to try and get the word out about seeking help and how important it is to, to get that immediate help. So thank you very much. We'll be right back after this break. Weekly in-depth coverage of the most local stories in Stratford, Perth, Brantford Branch, Guelph, Wellington, and the Waterloo region. Hyperlocal stories that matter to you and your community. All this and more on your region this week. All local, all year round. New episodes every Friday at 7 p.m. right here on Rogers TV. Our world is changing. Now more than ever, we have seen firsthand the brutality of systematic racism. Here in Canada, we can do better. It is time to connect, commit, and change. I'm Queen. And I'm Aaliyah Ali, and we're inviting you to join us on Diverse and Converse. We'll connect you with leaders from the Black, Indigenous, and people of color communities. Now is the time for change. We can be hurt, we can be bruised, we can be broken, slowed down, 
confused, and even numbed. But we can't be defeated. We're built on a foundation that's strong. Our mission, unwavering. And together, we'll beat as one. Long way from Nashville to Mama, I'll tell you that. Perform from Montreal to Boston to Los Angeles. But Toronto, that's my chosen home. Sure, when I'm walking down Young Street, I see some funny people who have the nerve to point the finger at me. And grin and smile and whisper. My song was number two on local radio. I sold 10,000 in Toronto alone. Turned down Ed Sullivan because they asked me to remove my makeup. Wouldn't do American Bandstand because of their segregation policies. I was just being me. Never tried to explain myself to anyone. And besides, none of that to worry, Jack, because I know I look good. Got a new way of loving, baby. Thought I want to teach it to you. Jackie Shane was a pioneer transgender soul singer, a central figure in the Toronto R&B scene. She helped shape what we know as the Toronto sound. Coming soon to Rogers TV. Join Carolina Suarez for Tapestry Hall Style. Wait to show you the latest Coming soon to Rogers TV. Life can be stressful. I know that. We're here to help you. Simple, easy recipes, amazing guests. At Home with Chef D, Wednesdays, 6 p.m. on Rogers TV. Welcome back to Kickback. We are now joined by Paige from Moratus Counseling Services. Paige, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Uh, we wanted to touch on um, how can a parent approach, like if they, for their kids, or maybe a caregiver too, like how can they approach their kids when it comes to mental health or seeking a counselor or a therapist? Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. Um, so I think a gentle approach in asking the questions, that it's really important to talk about what you've noticed, sit down with your child or your youth and notice what's been different lately and ask what they want. I think a lot of times children or youth don't get a lot of control in things. So what is it that they want? What are the outcomes? How would they see things being different? And when you're thinking about looking at a mental health professional, if that's what the child or youth wants, what would they look for? Who do they want? Does gender matter? Does location matter? Um, do they want virtual or in-person? So really taking the time to speak and, and listen to what they want. Uh, most agencies offer a free 15-minute consultation, which I think is super important to go and do a few of those. Check out some different clinicians, see who's a good fit, because I think that's really important too, making sure you have a really good fit of a, a mental health professional for your child and, and for yourself. Right, because it's not necessarily something that is, it's not something that it, it's like one session, right? Like it's something that it can be an extended relationship. Yes, absolutely. So you want to feel comfortable and confident with that person and you want your child to click with them as well. So both of those things. And yeah, generally you can have the free 15 minute consultation, but it could be many sessions down the road. So you want to make sure you like the person yeah. that you're working with. <laughs> yeah. So starting that dialogue is key, which yeah. can be tough for parents. Yes. Um, do you have any tips as to how parents can start that dialogue with kiddos? I think trying to be as calm as possible. I know these things are hard. They're difficult to talk about. So trying to be calm and confident in your approach and be really genuine. So being yourself, if you're a quiet person and you generally speak to your child that way, approaching that way, if you are more blunt, like being yourself, I think people really pick up on when you're not being like your genuine actual self. Mm -hmm. So trying to be genuine and calm and confident and really listen. So listen to what your child or your teen is wanting and and trying to take those things away and I think for parents to know that you don't have to know everything this is new to a lot of people the pandemic has created an increase in mental health for child and youth so this is new territory and that you don't have to know all the answers and right. what types of things are you seeing um, specifically with kids coming through the the pandemic so 
And I, I would say definitely the pandemic has increased things, but I think things were already increasing previous to the pandemic in terms of child and youth mental health. But definitely post-pandemic, um, social anxiety, uh, difficulty being around friends or, or knowing how to engage in those relationships, more uncomfortable being at school. I think also just difficulty with doing the workload at school because the workload was different when it was virtual. Uh, depression and definitely a rise in suicidal thoughts and self-harm thoughts. So parents keeping an eye out for those things as well. Right. right, and what what would those things be? Like what could what should parents be looking for, the caregivers? What should they be looking for um, in their kids? So I'll preface that by saying, you know, parents, you know your kids the best. You are gonna know what's different. I will give you some things to look for, and that might not be the same as your kid, or your kid might be a little bit different than this. Um, so things like withdrawing, so withdrawing into their room, they're in a dark room for a lot of the time during the day, they are spending less time doing things they enjoy, less joy doing those things when they are doing them. Um, if they are talking about suicide and self-harm, obviously that's an important right. factor. Sleeping, so oversleeping or undersleeping. And I would add, you know, teenagers need a lot of sleep, like nine to 10 hours. So mm -hmm. there is some normalcy in that. But again, what you know is different with your teenager. Right. Um, yeah, so those are some of the red, red flags I would, I would say to watch out for. Uh, do you have any tips for parents, caregivers, that like if they notice something, how to kind of broach that subject? Is there any certain questions that you can ask that maybe bridge that gap a little easier? Yeah, I think just asking like how the person is doing, and I know that that probably sounds really silly, but sometimes I will have young people come in and just say like, my parents don't ask me how I'm doing, or they don't know what's going on for me. So I think really trying to have that open and honest conversation and, and asking what's going on, that going back to that calm and confident, being that person, being a consistent person, so you know you're not just asking it one time and then and not coming back and asking it again so being consistent with that i think it's important depending on the age of the person too that you are thankful that they have opened up to you so being grateful and saying like thank you very much for sharing like i i'm glad that you told me these things so they feel like they can come back to you right and how do you feel about opening the dialogue even when things aren't seemingly bad is that helpful so before that might happen, like before you're noticing any signs, mm -hmm. that's what you're asking? Yeah. yeah, I think that's absolutely appropriate. You know, we've all gone through this collective trauma of this pandemic, so we can have those conversations. And if it's not your child, maybe it's one of their friends. So absolutely, having these conversations, mental health is more prominent. Let's talk about it. Let's reduce the stigma and, and just have the conversations, even if you're not noticing something specific right. with your child. Making it more of a dinner table conversation that's not threatening or scary yeah. but just something to encourage some vulnerability and opening up yes and that's I think amazing. the more you start with that the more likely the person is to open up eventually with it right yeah if right. they needed to is there an age limit like for beginning therapy for for kids so uh, wide range like most people depending on their age can go to therapy so young people as well it would just be a difference in the intervention or the therapeutic technique that's happening so for younger people there might be more play or art based involved and also family would be very very involved with young people so learning how to do different behaviors or reward systems or the family would be more so learning how to do it. And then as they get older, teenagers are less so wanting their family involved. And I would say to family, still be involved. Um, ask the clinician questions. Make sure that you're learning the skills too, because obviously parents are the people who are gonna be around a lot longer than a mental health professionals ever going to be. So for them to learn those things is super important as well. Right. And what is the benefit of an early intervention with a child and a family looking at some mental health support? I think the earlier, the better. It's learning new skills. It's learning, teaching the family new ways to coach the children through things. And that could detour you out of having to do it later. So learning new skills as a family, being able to implement those skills together could maybe make it so that you don't have to do it again as being a teenager or an adult life. There's just more, more likelihood that mental health is going to be treated earlier and not show up on the radar later on. Right. 
getting the support to talk about it. That's a big role of a therapist, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. So being able to hear the concerns that the parents have, sometimes you've never had a chance to say these things out loud or, or you really have no idea what to do. So really just learning, like there's an educational piece there too, being able to talk about it, being able to learn about it as well as for the children and teens. Right. What are, so say there's a, a caregiver at home or a parent at home yeah. that is, uh, they, they see something, what are the steps that they take to be able to get to somebody like yourself, to get to a support? Um, what does that process look like? Sure. So I would start with good old Google. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so looking it up after you've already talked to your teenager or child about what it is they're looking for. So looking it up, there's a website called Psychology Today that has tons of information, lots of different people on it. You can check filters and, and see like what that person wants, who you can connect with. You're also wanting to look up like therapeutic approach. You're wanting to go to someone who knows how to work with what it is that your teen or child is working with. And then I would just recommend setting up that free 15 minute consult, maybe doing a couple of those to get a sense of, of who you're looking for and what you like. And from there, typically it would be kind of an initial mental health assessment that would happen um, and uh, goal setting to right. what does the person want, what can we work together to move forward on. And wonderful, yeah. thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Um, and thank you for kicking Thanks. back with us. Um, this has been wonderful and we will see you soon. Thank you. Rogers TV viewer response line. Email us or connect with us on social media. My name is Chase Nicholas. I am a Mi'kmaq hockey player. Growing up, I always remember my family talking about the Mi'kmaq as the creators of the game of hockey. In grade seven, I did research on Mi'kmaq hockey sticks as the first sticks of the NHL. I found